Welcome back, everybody. Um, this is part two of our One World seminar for this week. Uh, we have Jean Christophe Mouvat from New York. Um, now, Jean Christophe has asked to, to do things in a slightly different format. So, um, we usually ask people to pose and even answer their own questions or be answered by other people in the audience. But uh, Jean Christophe will be amazingly he's got he's got a split brain he's going to be multitasking watching the questions um and i might help you with that and interrupt occasionally if you've missed a good one uh, and he'll answer them during the talk so so please don't hesitate um to 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 ask your questions or, or kind of make yourself known to me by raising your hand in the middle of the in the of the talk uh, so I, I don't have split brain i, I count on you andreas to to help me to figure this out <laughs> Okay. So please, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I don't know. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let, let's get started. So uh, Jean Christophe is going to talk about disordered models and Hamilton Jacobi equations. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I see many friends in the audience, and uh, it makes me happy to see you guys. I uh, hope you are doing well. Um, so, so today I'm going to speak about um, certain models of uh, statistical mechanics which have, which have disordered interactions. And the main point of the talk will be to highlight a connection between these models and certain partial differential equations, which are called hamilton jacobi equations. So let's get started. Um, so to, to give a, a setup, um, let's take, um, let's take uh, independent Gaussians. And, and let's say that uh, I want to understand the, the maximum over sigma, which is a vector of plus ones and minus ones of this sum, so sum over j i j, sigma i, sigma j. Sum over all i and j between one and n. Okay, so, so one way to, so I want to understand how this behaves when n becomes large for typical realizations of the j. One way to think about the problem is you have uh, n individuals and for each pair of individuals, you, you have uh, this j i j which encodes the quality of their interaction. So if they really like to be together, JIJ is positive and large. If they really dislike to be together, then JIJ is negative and large. And you, you're supposed to split these people into two groups. So there's the group of the plus one and the group of the minus ones. And you're trying to maximize the, the quality of the interactions within the groups uh, and assuming that the groups don't interact. So you see that um, the, the, the quantity that's, that's displayed will, will capture the overall quality of the best possible matching over all one, right? Because sigma i, sigma j will be equal to one if you have chosen to, that, that, that the individual i and the individual j are in the same group and it will be minus one if they are not in the same group. So you know, it's just up to a constant factor. It's, a, it's an encoding of the problem. So I want to think about that. And the, the, the main uh, feature of the problem is that um, it's not possible to satisfy, it, to make each pair uh, as uh, satisfied as possible at the same time, right? If, if for instance, um, you have three guys, I, J, and K, and I want to be friends with J, J wants to be friends with K, but K does not want to be friends with I, then there's no way you can make every pair uh, happy at the same time. So, so there is a, you know, I, could, I could write down uh, that there, there are frustrations in this problem. You know, you, it's, it's, it's complicated and, and suboptimal, or at least you know, it's not really suboptimal, but it's, it's a mess to find the, the, the right uh, optimum. And this really is the signature of uh, glassy objects, like the, what physicists would call the glasses. So, so one way, one, one word for these models is also uh, spin glasses. So spin because there are spins, you know, plus one and minus ones, and glassy because there are these frustrations. So, so I, I phrase the question as, as the, the, 
as, a, as, a, as about the maximum, but you can also make a gift measures out of this function, right? Like, like uh, when you do with the easing model. So if you want, it's like an easing model, but the interactions are random. And uh, in this specific model, uh, every uh, item interacts with every other item. So, so if I if I write down the the Gibbs measure, that would be uh, something that you know it would be a measure on the set of configurations of plus ones and minus ones, and to each configuration, it will give a probability proportional to exponential of uh, okay, some some parameter which. Okay, we can think about it, but let's take it for granted that this is the correct scaling times uh, this, this same function, sum of sigma i, sigma j. Okay, and more generally, I would like to understand the behavior of this measure, not just the maximum. So, so when, when beta becomes very large, the measure will be mostly concentrated on the maximum. So if you want, it's a soft relaxation of the maximum thing. And when beta is small, on the other hand, this thing will, will basically look like a uniform measure on all configurations. So, so it's not uh, uh, easy to directly confront the measure. So, so it's useful to, to first think of the, of the partition function, which is the, what you get when you sum over all possibilities uh, this quantity, you know, sum over all sigmas of this exponential. And you, you try to understand the large scale behavior of this thing. And Again, I, I'm not uh, explaining the scaling very well, but inside the exponential, typically the quantity would be of order n. So if you want to understand the, the large scale limit, it makes sense to, to take the log of that then, and then to divide by n. Okay. And, and this I, I can expect converges to a constant. So notice that it's still a random quantity, right? It depends on the j's. So, but the fluctuations will be small. So. Uh, I, I don't, I should not bother about it, but let's just to make sure they are not here, let's take the expectation. Okay. So, so now it's a deterministic object and I want to understand uh, its, its convergence when n becomes very large. Okay, I want to understand what happens when n goes to infinity. And the striking thing in my opinion is that this is a, a, actually a very difficult question and the answer is very non-trivial and uh, the, the first step towards understanding this thing was, was done by, by Parisi uh, in the late 70s and, and subsequent papers. Oops, I did not write this one properly. Okay, apparently I cannot write his name properly. Okay, P A R I S I. Um, so so it's, a, it's in the physics literature and he predicts a formula for, for this limit. And the formula is, is fairly complicated. Uh, you know, the, the way it's usually written, I, I cannot even remember it easily. It's, uh, and in fact, initially, so I have to say, it was relatively controversial, in, even in the physics literature, that this formula was valid. So I think so. Uh, part of the reason is that the, the manipulations involved are not just that uh, you know they don't do all the epsilons and deltas. It, it's a rather at least initially, it was a rather wild uh, technique. You know? It was not; it was far from rigorous mathematics. But but perhaps another reason is that the 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 formula starts uh, by looking like this. So it's it's an infimum over probability measures of of some of some quantity. Okay, and, and if you think about it, it's it's quite counterintuitive that it's an infimum over probability measures. And the reason it's counterintuitive is that, so, okay, maybe uh, first I take a step back. So when you have this, this sum over, um, uh, over all sigmas, you, you know, without really changing the problem, if I want, I can divide by two to the n. It's just, you know, moving everything by a constant, it doesn't matter. And so it, it's useful to think of this as a probability measure on, on the space of, of configuration. So it's your reference probability measure, if you want. And each time you have something of the form uh, logarithm, logarithm probability measure of exponential of something, let's call it F, it's well known that you can rewrite it as, as the supremum over probability measures of what well, the expectation under this probability measure of that function F minus the relative entropy 
of that measure with respect to the product measure that, that, we, that we start from. So th this is a very natural formulation uh, from a physics point of view. You know, you have this energy entropy uh, competition. The optimizer is the Gibbs measure and, and uh, all these things are related. So the thing on the left-hand side, you really want to write it down as a superior of probability measures and on the right-hand side, uh, it's an inferior of probability measures. So, so surely something uh, was wrong in, in this argument. But uh, you know, as time passed, uh, physicists understood more and more of this picture and, um, and they became convinced that although it was counterintuitive, in fact, it was correct. And, um, and then, uh, you know, for, for mathematicians, the definite confirmation arrived when we, when we figured out a proof of this result. So, um, oops, sorry, I want to not put it in green. So it came in, in two stages. So, so the first step was by uh, uh, Francesco Guerra in, in 2003. He, he proved the, uh, well, sorry about that. He proved one bound. Um, I don't know what happened. Uh, for for this uh, for this object, and um, and then uh, Talagram proved the other band uh, shortly afterwards. And um, and, uh, and and later, also the, the proof was uh, was refined and extended to other models by by Panchenko in in 2013 and, and this I have to say I'm also hiding a lot of contributions by other people including Eisenman, Argan, Portazen, Stickman, Roel and others so, so that, there's been a lot of work on this and, and yeah a lot of progress has been achieved and so this is a known result it's a mathematical result and still I want to talk about it and I want to think about it more so I have to explain uh, why I want to think about it despite the fact that it's already a known result. And I think part of it is that I still find it confusing in some sense. I find the, I don't know, maybe I find it difficult to remember or something, or maybe I find it surprising that we don't have, we don't seem to have the same uh, language to speak about what is before we, we have, before we pass to the limit in N and after, you know, it seems that we don't have um, the same way to talk about both sides or something, I find it surprising. Yeah, so that's kind of a fuzzy comment. So, so maybe to be more specific, it's also that I, I started to think about uh, what happens in a slight variation of the model where, where you have these items, uh, they are no longer completely interacting with no geometry. You have just very simple geometry you would have just two layers uh, of your spin. So, so, so let's say they, they look like this. And instead of having interactions uh, with, uh, with any, between any pair, uh, you will have uh, interactions uh, just any, every spin, every item interacts with every item in the other layer, but not uh, within layers. Okay, so I'm not drawing all the, all the links, but I hope you see what I, what I mean. If you, if you don't, uh, you can scream in the chat. Sometimes I look. So, so the whole point is, is that uh, this, is, this, is not, uh, this is not allowed, okay. And in this case, I realized that I was not able to write the formula and I thought, well, that, that, that is a sure sign that I don't understand what's going on. Um, and, and, and so, uh, so I, I I, I tried to think some more about it and what I'm going to present is, is uh, uh, you know, the result of, of this trying to think about it. So I'm going to, um, it is maybe I can, I can pause and uh, are there questions so far? Are things going okay? Are you, are you happy with the, with the talk? So far nothing in the chat box. And Christina thinks you're doing a great job. Okay, cool. Hi Milton. Hi Hamid. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so, so I'm going to, to present a, um, a precise result, but, but first uh, I'll try to display the main message in some vague terms. So, so the main message is that um, 
there are these uh, partial differential equations, Hamilton Jacobi equations. And, and, and these equations allow to rephrase the priority formula. Oops. And, and I, I would argue they, they, they help to synthesize the results more, perhaps more uh, easily, or at least uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, I find it easier to remember it in this, in this way. And uh, with, with this point of view, I think it also helps to clarify the nature of the difficulties we face depending on the model. So let's say clarify the difficulties. So, you know, wh why is it that uh, when, when, I, when I write the model with two layers, I, I just cannot figure it out. And when I write a layer with one layer, apparently we can figure this out. So I think th this, this uh, new point of view provides a, one way to understand what is going on, which, which uh, in my opinion is clarifying. And, and finally, you know, perhaps once you, you manage to actually name your problem in a more clear, you know, in a clearer way, maybe you have a better chance to attack it concretely. So, so hopefully, um, you know, you, maybe you can prove new results. And, and, and also I will argue, although this is more uncertain, it's possible that this point of view is, is un, unavoidable for certain models. So uh, maybe. Like, the, like this model with two layers. So, so this is highly uncertain, right? I, can, I cannot <laughs> mathematically justify that something is unavoidable, but it's just, uh, it's just my, my take on this. Okay. All right. Um, so so let, now, now that I, I, I wrote down this, this sort of message, uh, let me state a precise result. So, so the, the main result I, I want to present is, uh, is the following. Um, so let's say, um, let's say we fix uh, some parameter. I, I just, instead of beta, I write T for some reason. Um, so, okay, we're studying this uh, limit. One over n, export expectation, logarithm, sum over sigma of the exponential. So instead of beta, I write uh, square root of two t, and this is a two, uh, divided by square root of n times sum of j i j sigma i sigma j minus n t equals f of t delta naught. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm writing it and then I will comment on it. Um, yeah, so let, let, me, let me finish to write it. Little question now, uh, what's the letter before the T under the square root? Oh, it's a two. Yeah, I, that, a that, two. that blurb here is a two. Okay. And try to rewrite it, two. <laughs> it, it's, just a, it's just a normalization. Uh, okay, uh, it, it's, it's a convenient way to fix the parameter. It, it's just a, yeah. so, so instead of beta, I was code of two T, whatever, and uh, and also, uh, it's it's my fancy to to add this uh, extra nt here. So so maybe okay. About about this code of t times times the Gaussian, this feels natural, right? Because you know, when you think, you know, it looks like a Bourdieu motion. I, I'm, it's a natural scaling when we study Gaussians to 
to increase the variance linearly versus increasing the size linearly. And, and then if you, if you think that this is Bonnier motion inside the exponential, then you see that if, if you want to, to maintain constant expectation of the exponential, uh, you, should, you should add a compensating term, uh, which would be the quadratic variation. And this is this empty. So, so it's a natural normal, uh, way to, to normalize things, but uh, you see that it's a constant, so you can just uh, flush it through the exponential if you don't like it. So, so it's, not, uh, it's not very important. Is it another little question? Do you need a factor of two to the minus capital? Ah, yeah. So that's also a good question. So uh, I can add it or, or not. I can I actually find it more natural to have it, but uh, for some reason I thought you would prefer to not see it. So I have not written it. So so this also changes everything by a constant, and the equation does not see constant. So it will only change the initial condition, which I have not uh, described. So so the the statement with the two to the minus n here is also valid. Um, other question? So, so I did not uh, explain uh, very well. So, so the, on the right hand side, uh, this is f at t and, and delta zero is, is the, Dirac, the Dirac probability measure at, the, at zero. And, um, and so, so the, the, the function takes two arguments, uh, or this real parameter t and the probability measure. And, and the, okay, the equation is solved is the one that is written here. It's the first order equation. So I think what, one thing I need to explain is, is what, what is this derivative thing? You know, like we have a function that depends on the measure and we're differentiating with respect to the measure. What, what does it even mean um, with the Dirac? Yeah, yeah, okay. So it, the, the function is, is Lipschitz with respect to the, to the probability measure variable. So I mean, okay, yeah, it depends how. How uniform is the convergence? Yeah, everything is Lipschitz, so um, it's a uh, oh, locally it's a uh, it's pretty locally you have you have uniform convergence over a probability measure. Everything is Lipschitz. And psi, yeah, is a, is a secret. Uh, I, I'm going to uh, give some more hints uh, later in the talk, but that, that's a very good question. So it will be clarified a bit later. So so let me explain what this derivative uh, is. So, so you can just think that every measure is, is, a, is a sum of Dirac's. It doesn't matter, you know, the, everything is very regular. Like, anyway, just, let's just assume that the measure is a, is a sum of Dirac's. Oops, and uh, uh, it's hard for me to, to draw the uh, vertical lines apparently, but okay. So, so this is the representation of the measure. You know, I, just, I just draw a, a bunch of Dirac's like this. And for, for each point in the, in the support, so let's say this X here is the position of this, this specific Dirac, I'm going to define a D mu F of this measure mu, which, which is drawn at position X, which is in the support of the measure, by just uh, looking at the effect of uh, wiggling around uh, the Dirac uh, at position X. So, you know, if you, if you just pretend that all the Dirac sizes are fixed, and your function is just a function of the position of the Dirac, then it's just the normal derivative with respect to that position. Okay, so, so it's, uh, I mean, if you're familiar with this, it's more like a transport type of derivative. You're moving mass around and you're checking the reaction to this moving mass around. All right, um, other questions? Yeah, what is psi? Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, it's a secret. Um, yeah, so, so I, I want to make a few comments. So before I explain where, where this comes from, I want to make a few comments about why I find this result uh, uh, pleasant in, in some ways. Um, yeah, so, so the first uh, comment I want to make is, so, so th there is this, this quantity here, which is really the, this energy function. Let me give it a name. Let's, let's call it HN of sigma. And you see that, um, I don't know where I have this thing here. You have, um, really what is important is, is the, what, what is the covariance uh, of this object? So, so if I look at two positions, um, so imagine you're doing this calculation about uh, the covariance structure of this guy. Um, so you will have the sum of j, j, sigma, sigma, j multiplied by sum of 
JKL, C, uh, tau K, tau L, and all the correlations will vanish unless uh, IJ is equal to KL, right? Because the Js are independent. And what you get with, with, by doing that is, is the scalar product of sigma and tau uh, squared. And then, okay, you have to keep track of the scaling. So this, uh, uh, this is, uh, you, you, you can just uh, trust me on this. But the point is that you, you get a function of the scalar product and you, you get it squared. And what's, what's uh, uh, one thing which I, find, which I find interesting is that if you change the, the function hn, for instance, if you were doing a, instead of j i j sigma i sigma j, you could write three terms. You could write j i j k sigma i sigma j sigma k. Okay, and, and then what that, what that would change is that instead of this exponent two here, you would have a three. And, and if, if this happens, then all the result I just showed you would be the same, except this, this two here would be changed by a three. Okay, so, so really what, what you're seeing uh, in the, you know, more generally what, you, what you're seeing in this integral is just the function uh, that uh, drives or describes the, the covariance structure of, the, of your model. Jean-Christophe, so there was, um, there was a question. Yeah, that's Julia. right, so Julia, that, that's a good question. So, so the thing is, uh, if you want, the, the derivative will be a very big vector and I will index it by, by points in the support of the, of the measure. So instead of writing it as a big vector, I write it as a function of x. But uh, initially, you're right, the, the function it, it does not depend on x. But the derivative is, is, uh, is this giant list of, of, of okay, awesome. Um, okay, and, and now, yeah, I made, I made my point about um, uh, the covariance appearing in the equation. Yeah, so, so maybe a last point. Uh, yeah, and, and when, when this happens, when you change the covariance, the initial condition, which I have not described, uh, does not change. So at least uh, <laughs> we don't know what it is yet, but it does not change. Only the only the exponent that uh, that is in yellow in the screen. Uh, Sorry, these guys are relentless. So Hendrik is asking, does the derivative coincide with? Yeah, yeah, the it's. Uh, I think so. I think it's uh, it's the transport derivative. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and, and that last comment is that if instead of changing the the covariance of your function, you're changing this this reference measure here, this two to the minus n sum over sigma by some, for some other measure. Then in this case, what happens is that the, the evolution equation will, will not change, it will, it will remain the same. And all the effect will be uh, hidden in the initial condition that is there, which I have not described, but uh, go ahead. Uh, all right, are there further questions on this point? Besides the mystery of the uh, initial condition. Yes, that's right. The, so the, the integral uh, is, is with respect to x. So you, for each fixed mu, you can calculate this term in the equation, which is integral of d mu x squared of mu and x, d mu of x. That's right. uh, thanks for the questions. It is really pleasant for me to, to have, uh, to feel that there is feedback. Um, all right, so, and now, um, I want to come back for, for, for a second uh, to, to this model with two layers that I was doing uh, here. You remember this, this model with two layers? So I want to come back to it. So just to, to splash uh, on you uh, the equation that appears for this other model. Uh, so two layers. So, so this uh, I cannot prove for the two layers thing. I can only prove one bound, but, uh, but I believe it's correct. Um, the equation in this case, so in this case there are two layers and so you will have to have two measures uh, in your function instead of one. So I, I call them mu one and mu two. And The structure looks sort of similar, except that instead of having the d mu squared, it, it splits into uh, these two, the product of two derivatives. And it's not crucial that you really focus on the, 
on the definition, you know, on the specific uh, form of the equation. But what's important to notice is that the, the nonlinearity here is not convex. While uh, in the equation that was displayed uh, here on top, with, with the square function, that was a convex nonlinearity. And when you have a convex nonlinearity in these equations, it's well known, at least in the finite dimensional case, that you can write the solution in a variational form. It's the hopf lax formula. And you know, if you want to bridge uh, the statement I showed you to, to the formula that, uh, that is used usually, you, that, that's the steps you, you can do. You, you, you start from the equation, let's say, and you write this hopf lax formula, and then you massage it somehow, and then you find uh, the formula. But the thing is, this requires that the nonlinearity is convex. And, and for the two-layer uh, model, the nonlinearity is no longer convex. You know, it's like a, if, you, if you take a pair x, y, and you spit out the products x times y, this is not a convex function. That, that's all I, what I'm saying. And so there, there's model, for this model, there is, no, um, there is no variational formula, as far as I can tell. Oops. So a quick question from Nat there. Um, why is it natural, natural physically to think that this is a function of t? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I think of it as some sort of um, uh, it, analogous to when you do a renormalization flow, but uh, it's a bit uh, unclear if it's a good analogy. You know, you, it's like you're, you're flowing from when t equals zero where you understand everything is just the reference measure that is showing up. And then you, you progressively add uh, what is difficult in your problem. And, and, and hopefully you, you understand the, the, way, the way this, uh, this happens. But uh, I mean, it's a bit of a, yeah, a bit shaky. Okay, that's my understanding. Right, so, so I, I, I suppose, although this I cannot justify, that uh, in, in, in the case of the two-layer model, uh, the, the best way to, to describe the, this free energy is, is by using the equation. There is no other way. So, so, to, so this was, uh, you know, I described properties of the, of the result, but not really why the result is true. And I, I'll try to explain it uh, more clearly on the toy model, uh, which is the Curie-Weiss model. So it will be very simple and it, it, the, the model it can be solved in a variety of ways. And it, it, to some extent, the way I'm going to solve it is, is a bit uh, too complicated for, for, for the model maybe. But, uh, but the, the point is that the strategy I'm going to present, I think is very robust to other models. So for instance, I use this for models which are of intermediate difficulty between Curie-Weiss and, and the spin glass model, which come from statistical inference. And it worked uh, very efficiently there. So you know, bear with me if you find the model too too simple. I think it's still useful to think about it. So the the, the Curie-Weiss model is what happens when instead of having these random interac uh, random interactions, you just uh, assume that it's a deterministic interaction. Every j is equal to one. So one over n log sum over sigma. Sum over sigma i plus h sigma j plus h sum of sigma i. Okay, so I, I add the magnetic field also because you know, I, I add this uh, plus h sum of sigma i. I think it's, it's, it's interesting. So I, I removed the disorder. Then the scaling has changed a little bit, but uh, it's because it's not disordered anymore. And, and really, I, I would, you know, ultimately, I would want to understand the, the probability measure associated with this, which I will denote like this. So by definition, this is the sum over sigma of f of sigma exponential of blah, blah, blah. You know, blah, blah, blah is the same as above, divided by the sum over sigma of exponential of blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, so ultimately we want to understand the measure, but, um, but it's really useful to understand the, this function fn first. And it, maybe it sounds surprising to focus on this 
object first, but you should really think of it as a, it's the moment generating function of the quantities you care about. So if you understand the moment generating function, you understand your object very well. So that's one way to understand why it's useful. It's not the only one. But. So, so for this model, I want to display how equations will arise uh, uh, for, for FM. And so let's just try to compute derivatives and see what happens. Uh, let's say I compute the derivative with respect to, to H. Then, okay, there's the one over N in front all the time. Oops. And, and then you have the, this, this logarithm that you're supposed to differentiate. So you, after you differentiate, you have a ratio of the derivative divided by the, the, the function itself. And when you compute the derivative in H of, of this exponential, it's this, this term over sigma i, which will uh, come and, and show up in front here, right? So, so in the end, you, you will have something exactly of the form uh, that is displayed here, right? You will have this ratio and for f of sigma, you will have sum of sigma. So long story short, you find this, okay? And if you differentiate with respect to t, uh, well then the same thing happens, right? It's just that in this case, it's whatever is in front of t that, that shows up uh, in your, in your, in your expectation. And, and because that's kind of the simplicity of curry bias, you can rewrite this thing as in terms of one over, uh, in terms of the sum squared. Oops, I <laughs> wrote squared a bit too many times. Okay, so, so if you don't look at this too, too carefully, you think that that's kind of interesting. The, the time derivative is the square of the h derivative. So, so that's, not, that's not quite true. Um, but it's a, it's a good thing to, to, to make this, this mistake, let's say. So, so this really is the variance of this. I don't know why this happened. Um, of this mean magnetization, let's say. So, so it's not zero, but uh, you know already what this magnetization is, is, is between minus one and one. So it's already of order one. And now we're looking at the variance of this thing. So you know, if you're a bit optimistic, uh, you think ah, there will be a bit of cancellation. This will be small. And so, so already it suggests to you that maybe as n goes to infinity, uh, the function will solve uh, the equation where you just put zero on the right hand side. And so you want to make this more rigorous. So, so I think the, the next question is how, how can you, how can you express this variance internally in terms of Fn? You know, I said Fn is the, is the moment generating function. So in some sense, it should encode information about the variance of this quantity as well. And I guess it's not surprising that if you take the second derivative of Fn, this will be related to the second moment of, of the, the variable of interest. So I'm not going to do this calculation, but, but it's not a difficult calculation. What you can see is that um, what is on the right-hand side, in fact, is one over n times the second derivative of f. And once you're there, um, in terms of, you know, as it comes to understanding the large scale behavior of fn, you're, you're really done. Like uh, the, you can stop thinking about the probabilistic model. You have an equation for fn. It's remarkable that it's an exact equation in this case. And, uh, and now you can turn to your analysis friend and, and ask it what happens with that thing. Right? And, and question from tell Luigi there. Say. Sorry, what did you say? There's a little question from Luigi. About the oh, angle yes. bracket. Yeah, that's right. So, so implicitly, yeah, the, this bracket is a measure that depends on t and h. That's right. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. And so um, for, for this specific example, we, we see that uh, you can justify that Fn converges to F solution of 
dtf minus dhf squared equals zero. Yeah, and, and I have not talked about the initial condition. Again, I have this bad habit, but, but now I think it will be very easy to see that in this, in this case, uh, things behave really well. So let, let me go back to the definition of fn. So here it is. And, and suppose for a second that t is equal to zero. So, so let me just dash this guy. Then you see that the, the, the expression becomes really nice because you have exponential of the sum. And so you can write it as, as a, a product. And then you can factorize, it's, it's the sum over sigma, but this is a, you know, it's a product measure and then you have a product. So, so you can factorize this uh, one more time. And once you have done all these manipulations, you discover that in this case, when t is equal to zero, the function fn in fact does not depend on n. Okay, so um, the initial condition in fact here is um, f at t equals zero is uh, f1 at t equals zero. And that property is also true for the spin glass case. So I have not really explained fully what, what's going on, but at least the, the fact that it's a, it's a one body, you know, it's a, like, it's a non-interacting uh, thing that, that shows up uh, for the initial condition is also valid in the spin glass case. Yeah, and, and maybe once you see it, you, you're thinking, what do I learn about my probabilistic model from, from this PD? And, and this will have uh, shocks, in the, the, the limit will have shocks in its derivatives. You know, when, when t is, uh, is small, the, the function will be smooth as a function of h. But then after, after t becomes sufficiently large, you will have a corner in the function uh, when near h equals zero, as soon as t is above some threshold. And that is significant because the, the derivative of this function, they capture the, 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 this mean magnetization, the, the line on top of the, what is displayed here. So if you have a corner of the derivative, it means that when h is you know, positive, but very tiny, the mean magnetization is positive away from zero. And when h is negative, very tiny, the uh, magnetization is negative away from zero. So, so you, you see phase transitions in these singularities of the limit equation. All right. Um, Yes, also, uh, like, I think it's also a good time to add a comment about uh, in, in the, I forgot to say earlier, but in the theorem I showed uh, at the very beginning, I would like to have an intrinsic approach. Uh, you know, so the, the theorem about the spin glass, it's a theorem, I, you know, it's proved, but in some sense, I consider that I cheated to prove it because I have not, uh, given a proof that starts from scratch and achieves this result using the PD uh, thinking. I, I just wanted to check for my sanity, if you want, that the description was correct with the PD. So I just borrowed the formula that was already proved and, and just, you know, uh, mess things around up, up, up until the moment I could verify that it, it also matches the equation. But ultimately, I, I, I wish that, and I think it's necessary that we develop an approach that uh, just you know, uses this PD uh, thinking to prove the result. So that, that's still uh, in development. Eh? Right now, I can only prove uh, one bound also for the bipartite case, but uh, ultimately, I hope uh, we have uh, understanding along these lines. Are there further questions? Uh, I, think I have a very little time, but I, I will just sketch uh, very briefly in five minutes. Uh, how this behaves in the spin glass case. Everything good so far? You're still happy? Quick one from Hendrik there. Um, yeah, for, 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 easing, uh, for easing on the lattice, uh, is going, I don't think you can easily wrap uh, equations like this. Maybe. I think there's a, an old paper of Chuck Newman where, where he may use some of intuition kind of like this to get bounds on, on critical exponents. But you, I think uh, for lattice models, you, you, you probably can only hope for uh, comparisons. You know, it, it will not be 
the, the fact that we can complete, completely wrap up the equation uh, is a bit of a miracle, in my opinion. Uh, maybe, I don't know if Shugan is agreeing, is agreeing on that. Too. All right, so, so back to, uh, back to spin glasses. So, so one thing which uh, looked very innocent, so I, in, to some extent I, I, I made a, I tricked you a little bit uh, when I presented the curie vice model in, in a way which uh, uh, maybe it's, when I wrote the first line, the very first line here, when I wrote the definition of Fn of T and H, I said, oh yeah, I'm going to add the magnetic field because why not? That was not honest. <laughs> I had to add this magnetic field because otherwise I would not have, been man have managed to close the equation. Uh, if, I, if I just write the, the if, I, if I forget to write this thing, I can differentiate in T to my house content, I will not manage to close the equation. So, you know, it looks very innocent for curry bytes, but, but really the first step is to understand what are the quantities you're supposed to add in, in this uh, energy function that ultimately will allow you to close the equation. And for spin glasses, it's a non-trivial question. And, and you see that it has two benefits. Like first, you can close the equation. And second, when you set t equals zero, it becomes a simple model in, and, and then you can compute it. So, so it has to have these two features of being sufficiently rich, but also sufficiently simple that you can compute what happens when, when only this term is present. Yeah, yeah, Simone, I agree. I thought it was uh, Chuck Newman, but uh, I agree with what you're saying. At least I think I saw a paper of Chuck. All right, so. Let me rewrite the. this quantity. And the point I was trying to make is, is now we have to think about what is this extra term we, we should be adding um, in this exponential. And what, one way to think about it is you, you can think that this, this term looks like this and, and you're trying to, to find uh, some effective model that captures uh, this guy. You know, like you would like something that's like one body type uh, interactions, you know, that only looks at uh, some of sigma j's and, and that somehow here has some term that represents this behavior. And maybe as a first pass, we could try um, to, to have a random magnetic field. And then there are the the useless uh, normalization things, which let's not care about this. Okay, so, so here I, I want these guys to be uh, independent Gaussians. Okay, and it's my first try for adding a quantity that hopefully will, will close the equation. And now I'm going to just uh, write down the formulas, but it's, again, it's, it's not difficult to, to make these calculations. So there will be a Gist measure associated with this exponential. And, and when I compute the, the derivative, what I find is, is the following. So this is the scalar product between sigma and sigma prime. And sigma prime is the, this thing is an independent copy of sigma. Okay, under the, I should write under, under the Gibbs measure. Okay, so it comes by doing some Gaussian integration by parts. And when you differentiate in T, uh, what you find instead is expectation of sigma dot sigma prime divided by N squared. And so it looks very promising. It looks like the curry bytes model. You're thinking, ha ha, now I know, uh, probably dt fn minus dh fn squared 
is going to be close to zero. And uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, this is not true, unfortunately. <laughs> That's the problem. It's, it's still it's still a variance. It's, it's the variance of this uh, scalar product of this overlap. But uh, but it's not true in this case that the overlap is uh, has a small variance in general. It will only be true for small t. So for small t, this will the equation will be valid, but only for small t. And uh, so I, I should say also that this intuition is not mine. Right? It, it's been developed uh, by many people. Uh, you, know, you can see it's uh, very uh, nicely written in the paper of Gura, for instance, or many places. So, so like the intuition of, of uh, Parisi, Mezar, and physicists also is that the overlap is, is not going to be uh, concentrated. And instead, it will have a more complicated uh, structure. And so, so I go back to here. So, so the, the, the message here is that the, this guess that we were trying with the sum of sigma i, uh, uh, sigma, sum of zi sigma i, let me erase this, uh, was, was too naive. And instead we, we need to have a more complicated uh, And uh, so, so I'm not, I, I won't have time to, to explain this, but um, you know, over time people uh, developed uh, intuition and, math, and then math, mathematical understanding of the fact that the Gibbs measure is going to organize itself in an ultrametric structure. And, and so you, you have to, find, to have a, an object that captures this specific uh, ultrametric structure uh, in here. And, and this, this, uh, this more refined object instead of being captured by a single parameter h, it will be captured by a measure, by a probability measure on the on the positive region. And so, but uh, you know, in terms of uh, formal manipulations, what you do is for, from this naive equation that you got, you just replace the naive parameter by a measure, and you find uh, the equation that I presented to you uh, at the beginning. Okay, and this I think is a general principle for any models. You write the naive equation and you replace everything by a measure and you're done. Okay. So I'm running uh, out of time, so, so let me conclude. Um, so um, I think uh, the, the first message is that I think a lot remains to be understood. I presented the uh, the case with with two layers as as an example, but it's really one among many. Um, there are plenty of other models where, where we don't understand what is going on, and I think uh, yeah, this this point of view with partial differential equations. Um, the the it it allows us to to uh, synthesize previous results. And also to, to maybe clarify them and uh, to, to phrase uh, new conjectures. Also, yeah, also to clarify the, the nature of the difficulty, you know, whether or not the monetary is convex, we see that the model will be very different. And, and hopefully also prove new results. All right, so I mentioned the uh, uh, one, uh, Result which I think is new, which is about this two-layer case, which we have one bound comparing the the limit for energy with uh, with this uh, equation. But uh, I don't have the other bound yet. All right, so that's it for today. Uh, thanks for your attention. Hey, thank you very much. Um, so we did have quite a few questions in in the chat box, but we've got a, mute, a few more coming. So off is asking, is it simple to write down the secret psi? Ah, yeah, so, so I think now you have a good idea of what you have to do. So, so you, you, you go back to this definition and uh, instead, of, instead of writing this, you write, uh, you replace ZI by, uh, by some uh, random field, uh, which is built from a, a real priority cascade, right? And, and, and you set T equals zero. And, and you set n equals to one, the, the thing will not depend on n when t is equal to zero, and, and that's your sign. 
Does that make sense, Offer? Um, Offer, I'm going to try and unmute you just in case I cannot find you. <laughs> Wait a minute, Evan. So, Offer, oh, you, you, you can talk now if you want. Maybe he doesn't want to talk. <laughs> no, perhaps not. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions? Oops. Oh, sorry. Is that okay? Uh, oh, can I speak now? There you are. Yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, yes. Sorry, I was muted locally. Um, <laughs> um, do you, in, 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 in that expression that you write now in replace the ZI, are those related somehow to the solution of top equations or not? Uh, I think not. So they are, they are naive. So, so you, you, don't, you don't have to fine tune them in some, you don't have to say, oh, they have to satisfy the top equations or it, you, you just write any, you, you don't try to match the parameters. You just have to make sure that the family, you know, it's like when, when for curry vice, I'm not trying to say I take H to be exactly the right mean magnetization. I'm just adding it and then finding relations between parameters. And in this, in this case, it's the same. So I don't know if it makes sense, but um, maybe along the characteristics of the equation, you will see that so the type equations have to be satisfied or something like this. I'm not sure I have not thought about this much, but when you define the object, you, you, you don't have to think about it. So it's just a vector with correlations. That's what you're saying? Yeah, that's the right. ZI will has, be just a vector kind of, uh, with, a correct, with a correct correlations. That's right, that's right. I see, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Are there any more um, questions? Milton raised his hand, so he, if you locally unmute yourself. Hi, uh, okay, so usually um, one way I see uh, this type of results are useful is that because the, the PDEs are simple enough to, uh, uh, to give us uh, additional properties uh, about uh, the original models which were hidden before. So do you think that uh, this could be the case here that uh, looking at the PD, we can find uh, new properties of, uh, of, the, of, of our original model that, that could be that's, useful? That's a good question. So, so I suspect that in the case when, when the nonlinearity is convex and you can write the, the hub flux formula, then the answer will be no, because probably the hub flux formula is very convenient. In some sense, you know, up to some change of variables, it was already known. So, so I suppose that in this case, there will be no additional information, except maybe uh, you find better ways to, to understand how to prove convergence and maybe to find rates or something. But so, so maybe it's useful in, in the proof of convergence, but not in terms of finding properties of the limit. But in the case when the nonlinearity is not convex, then, uh, well, in this case, I think uh, there's no other way to talk about the limit anyway. So <laughs> in this case, this is useful. Okay. Um, we have another question from Simona. Uh, actually, I'm going to unmute you, Simona. You can ask your question yourself. You need to unmute at your end as well. Okay. So uh, that's, that's very nice. Um, in, is there any hope somehow to prove these, for, for these glass systems, to prove these freezing transitions from the PDE without actually having the explicit solution? So at least, uh, I'm not sure if, I, if I'm uh, very clear in my head on what is the freezing transition, but well, you, I, 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 only, I, I only know how to do a very limited number of things. So, so I think it's easiest if I just uh, tell you what I know how to do. <laughs> So what, what I try to do is to verify that there is a, a transition from replica symmetric to uh, non-replica symmetric systems. And so by looking at the PDE, you, you can check that when t is small, uh, the, the, you, you will only look at uh, uh, replica symmetric measures. And, and when after a threshold, you will need to look further away. But uh, I haven't done any uh, more refined analysis. Which, it doesn't mean it's not possible. I only found a few things. But, but that's that's actually cool. Okay, so do you so do you is is the feature a shock? Um, no, no. I, I, um, at least in the model I understood, I think it's it's not. A, it does not have a singularities in the derivative, which was also surprising to me. But 
So this is something I don't understand very well, but my, my, my impression is that um, the way this transition happens is not uh, causing a singularity in the first derivative. So, so the intuition from uh, Curie Weiss is, is a little bit misleading in this respect. I mean, it's not something I understand very well, but uh, for, for a long while I tried to understand what is the structure of the shock, what is the structure of the shock, and then I thought, ah, maybe there's no shock. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Otherwise, we can wrap this up. Okay. 